there she is. There's Barbara Waters. Well, welcome back to Shipping Insight TV 2020. That was a riveting panel on cybersecurity and digitalization. And it, the strong message was it starts at the top. Huge. What did you think about that previous panel and what do we have to look forward to next? Well, that's a fantastic uh, panel. Uh, I was mesmerized by some of the comments that were coming up, but I'm also uh, very much uh, engrossed in the next panel. Uh, the discussion is going to be safety on the high seas, crew welfare changes, policies, etc. And I've got a very close relative that has been very involved in this all of his career uh, as a safety engineer at one point and then the senior accident investigator for the administration he worked for. And uh, he takes uh, safety at sea very, very seriously. But I'm prepared for this next set, uh, session also. I've got my Bahamas Maritime mug here, and I'm going to introduce Tom Jenkins of the Bahamas Maritime Authority, and he's going to take us through safety on the high seas. Take it away, Tom. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this deep dive session on safety on the high seas brought to you by Shipping Insights 2020. I'm delighted to be hosting this event alongside Mark O'Neill, where we will be discussing crew welfare and challenges facing the industry in the current climate. Our anchor, Mark, a former maritime lawyer who brings a wealth of knowledge to this discussion from his vast experience in shipping, ship management, banking, and offshore sectors, having led the international law firm Reed Smith's German shipping team and co-led the firm's offshore department prior to his current position as president and CEO of Columbia Ship Management. Now we're also joined today by a highly experienced panel who have the combined experience across almost every sector within our industry to inform and guide this discussion. And my name, as you know, is Tom Jenkins and I head the, the BMA's casualty investigation department. Before we begin, I would like uh, to give you a little bit of background of what we do. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the Bahamas, uh, sorry, and, and next slide, my apologies. Uh, the Bahamas Maritime Authority is one of the largest flag state registries in the world with over 50 million gross tonnage of ships flying the Bahamas flag in every corner of the globe. Our commitment to quality and safety is built upon our key values of progress, honor, and service. This is achieved with excellence and innovation in mind. Our fleet comprises of a multitude of vessel types from bulk carriers to yachts and almost every vessel in between. Now this gives us a unique standing in supporting the industry in almost every sector with our dedicated teams of specialists to maintain our maritime capability through the adoption, implementation and enforcement of the international requirements and best industry practices. We have a very proud reputation for quality which is recognized globally as the leading flag in seven of the 10 poor state control regimes against competitors, with white lists and low risk flag status in Paris and Tokyo MEU, and consecutive Qualship 21 status since 2017. Next slide, please. Now, one area which we're asked regularly is whether safety has reduced since March 2020, and likewise, if we've seen an increase in the number of marine casualties. When we talk about safety on the high seas, we need to look at the data. As you can see within our statistics for the Bahamas fleet, we've not seen an increase in the number of very serious and serious marine casualties since the start of the global pandemic. Historically, we investigate approximately 16 very serious marine casualties per annum, which in accordance with the IMO legislation incorporates any marine casualty, which has resulted in loss of life, loss of a ship, or severe marine pollution. We will also investigate serious marine casualties and incidents where we believe lessons can be learned to prevent recurrence and ultimately improve safety. Now there have been three recent major casualties which have received a lot of attention with some quick to attribute the cause to COVID-19 or Casio, Gulf Livestock One and New Diamond. As investigators continue to analyze the events, it is too early to speculate on causation. And therefore we do not yet know if COVID-19 influenced or contributed towards these tragic events. Unfortunately, marine casualties continue to occur around the world, regardless of flag, far too often. The industry does not appear to be improving. 
and the need to improve safety and continuously learn from accidents must develop at a greater rate if we're to eliminate loss of life and damage to the marine environment. Next slide, please. And before I introduce the panel, I would like to take this opportunity to set the foundations of this deep dive. The maritime world as we know it has not faced the challenges currently experienced. And although mariners are renowned for finding solutions to problems, working in arduous conditions, and in general, demonstrating courage and adversity to overcome the worst that can be thrown at them, I think it is safe to say that whilst they are upholding the finest traditions expected of them, most recently highlighted by the actions of the master and crew on board the Maersk Etienne during its rescue of 27 migrants in August this year. More must be done to protect these individuals, the same individuals who provide a lifeline to so many. So what are some of the concerns and challenges of the shipping industry in the current climate? Commercial challenges continue to exist and impact every sector of the industry from construction all the way through to the end of the vessel's life cycle. The immediate challenges posed by COVID-19 are wide reaching and the full impact may not be known for some time. There is no doubt that the global economic crisis has serious implications, reducing access to finance and potential drive towards change in trading patterns and new environmental regulations and decarbonisation are just some of the challenges that lie ahead. More pressing though, in August 2020, it was estimated that over 150,000 seafarers required immediate repatriation, with as many as 300,000 serving on extended crew contracts who were unable to return home. Additionally, those needed to join their vessels in order to work, maintain a livelihood and keep the world fleet moving were unable to do so. So what has the International Maritime Organization achieved since March? The IMO has established a seafarer crisis action team to help resolve individual cases, often working alongside other organizations like the ILO, ITF, International Chamber of Shipping and flag states such as ourselves. Since the beginning of this crisis, this dedicated team works around the clock, contacting representatives from national governments, NGOs, trade unions and relevant associations, orienting seafarers towards the right organization to find a solution. However, the situation remains complex and difficulties are still reported. In some cases, the key worker designation may only apply to nationals of a particular country and restrictions still apply to seafarers from other countries, leaving foreign crew unable to transit through that country for repatriation. The difficulties surrounding repatriation and crew changes also have a major impact on the shipping industry and have been identified as a priority issue with the IMO and other organisations urging governments to intervene. The matter has been taken up by the United Nations Secretary General who expressed his concern about the growing humanitarian safety crisis facing seafarers around the world and called upon all countries to formally designate seafarers and other marine personnel as key workers and ensure crew changeovers can safely take place. However, despite the proactive efforts of the maritime community, such as industry players, individual member states and associations, little has been achieved to find a consistent and effective solution to this crisis. This is an international crisis that requires an international response. This will only resonate at the appropriate level when supply chains break down. How else do we recognize the true value of international maritime trade? This reactive approach should be the last resort and disappointingly will certainly impact the very members of the industry we are trying to protect. This serves as a further plea for state governments to recognize the consequences of their actions and find a logistical solution to safely afford free movement of key workers across borders. I would now like to introduce our first guest, Captain Matt Edwards from the US Coast Guard. Hi, well, great, thank you. Um, just a quick comms check, if you can hear me. Loud and clear, Matt. All right, great, well, thanks so much and, uh, and thank you for that introduction. Uh, yeah, so I'd like to, uh, to focus these uh, few, few minutes here on the, the Coast Guard's compliance policy during the COVID-19 pandemic. So if we can go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> you know, COVID-19 um, was definitely a shock to, to the maritime system 
Um, the, the maritime system, like the rest of the world, was not immune to the initial uh, effects. Um, the, that strength of the global shipping market suddenly became its biggest weakness as the, the virus spread throughout the world. Port operations, crew reliefs, cargo transfers were halted or dramatically reduced in certain ports. And the uh, just-in-time supply chains that we've uh, grown accustomed to were, were disrupted. Next slide, please. So the Coast Guard had to take a close look to see how we could balance our compliance regime with the reality of keeping the world's commerce moving, or at least commerce in the United States. <clears throat> the Coast Guard, like the rest of the industry, was, um, was affected. Our, our first initial actions were aimed at preserving the Coast Guard workforce. So what, did we, what could we do to protect our men and women um, so that if there was another, um, another call, another disaster during the pandemic, we still had a, an active duty force that we could deploy. So after we were able to uh, pull back our own operations, put our, our own workforce into a, a little bit of isolation, we started to then look to see um, within the appliance program, how could we evaluate the risks of the marine transportation systems um, while ensuring certain compliance rules were in place, but relaxing others? Um, I would say one of the, the vital inputs that we received during this uh, decision process and ongoing was the information that we received during calls hosted um, by the Maritime Administration or MARAD with the, the um, maritime industry, both the ports, um, international shipping and coastwise shipping throughout the United States. So that's where uh, a very important feedback loop as to the measures that we were putting in place. Uh, we also used that data analysis to employ um, monitor what was going on with our marine transportation system and monitor how the Coast Guard's workload um, should be uh, reallocated. Next slide, please. We primarily use um, marine information safety bulletins to communicate the Coast Guard's position regarding the compliance program and the different measures that we were taking. So we addressed issues such as vessels arrivals from certain geographic regions who were permitted to continue to conduct cargo operations, albeit perhaps leaving the crew on board. We re-emphasized um, re the vessel's responsibility to report COVID-19 to uh, Center for Disease Controls and our um, local health offices. And we also addressed port and facility operations to permit for some social distancing to ensure that seafarer access was not impeded, um, to provide for facility escorts uh, due to security regulations and permit some delay in testing of equipment at our facilities. Next slide, please. For Mariner credentials, we, like the rest of the, the world, extended national endorsements. Um, we extended medical certificates and we provide some allowances on how courses and programs were traditionally uh, traditionally taught. So alternative training measure methods were authorized. We also permitted a reduction in the drug testing and a relaxed enforcement on the, uh, the testing rates that would normally be required. Transportation worker identification reader requirements were further delayed and our ballast water treatment system compliance states were extended to allow the industry um, some additional time to adapt. Finally, uh, vessel Inspections, exams, and documentations uh, were, um, were likewise addressed. And, I, and I'd like to focus in on this last point. If we go to the next slide. So the Coast Guard, classification societies, and other flag administrations throughout the world were challenged during COVID-19 and that they were unable to board vessels and conduct normal compliance measures. And so from the Coast Guard perspective, we had to evaluate, did we want to delay inspections um, with, the, with the, uh, the downfall of not knowing how long COVID-19 would be with us and then having a, a tidal wave of inspections that we were gonna have to catch up with in addition to our normal workload or were we able to explore some alternative methods for inspection and surveys? So we, um, we took a look at the risk and we, uh, we authorized remote verification tools on a limited basis for both the Coast Guard Marine inspectors and the recognized organizations for, um, performing work on our behalf. This was a short-term solution set to ensure that vessels remain in safe operation. 
And I will say that we saw creativity from both the industry and the regulators to apply these new tools. And you can see there um, to, to the right of this, um, of this slide, you know, we used Zoom, Microsoft Teams, and there's a, there's a site from uh, Rena and, and how they were conducting some of their remote inspections. So we saw a, a wide variety of tools that were being exercised. Next slide, please. And with this wide variety of tools, we had some lessons learned. I would say our, our first lesson learned is nothing beats the boots on deck of a vessel to ensure compliance. Inspectors and surveyors need to hear, smell, and touch to be effective in their jobs. We also determined that the li limited connectivity on board certain areas in, of the vessels were an impediment to conducting a thorough inspection. The lighting and the angles create difficulties to evaluate 3D objects in a 2D, 2D space. But I, I will say that we had um, some successes with the exploring synchronous versus asynchronous methods of virtual inspections. In other words, some of them were, were a live feed, much like we're doing um, this morning. Other ones were uh, feeds that were emailed back and forth through uh, a series of several days. Next slide, please. I would say that uh, what we're faced with and what we're still within is the necessity is the mother of invention. Uh, remote compliance tools build a critical gap and we recognize that. And the Coast Guard will look to establish guidelines uh, to use remote tools based on the lessons learned um, over the last several months. Um, however, I would say that uh, these tools are not going to be a, a substitute for the regulators going on board. And we recognize that COVID-19 is a unique situation, but we will, uh, we're still looking to put um, marine inspectors and recognized organizations, surveyors on board these vessels. I do think what we, what we will see going forward is a greater hybrid approach to vessel inspections and surveys. That in which we use remote or virtual tools for part of the exam so that we can free the crew time up um, rather than being on board. There's no reason that the document checks, for example, can't be done in a home office before going on board the vessel and occupying the crew's vital time. Next slide, please. So I'll just end with, uh, with our, our way forward. The Coast Guard, uh, with industry input, uh, implemented measures to keep maritime operations moving safely amidst the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And we had to do some, some risk trade-offs for this. We look to industry to help signal when normal operations may resume. <clears throat> and um, we, we continue to balance based on industry's feedback, these short-term versus long-term effects of relaxing the standards. At some point, we're just going to have to return to normal. But I will say that COVID-19's lessons learned will help improve efficiencies to the, to the marine transportation overall. But most importantly, I would say, much like the conference that we're having today, it's reinforced the value of the in-person work and interaction. So that, that's the, my, my last slide and, and I'll stand by at the end for any other questions. Tom, and I think you're on, you might still be on mute. Troll. I do get control. Good, uh, and I've got my face back apparently as well, which is um, which is useful. Uh, <laughs> not for you, but for me. Um, uh, Matt, thanks so much for that. Really interesting, uh, and uh, and I think um, I think some of the areas you highlight, particularly the lessons learned and uh, and remaining flexible. I think um, I'm going to ask Mark now from a from a ship management perspective, um, the short term versus long term. Um, uh, what's, what's been your experience operating in and out of, uh, of the US, Mark? Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Tom. Thanks, Matt. I mean, I think um, uh, the, the US has uh, adopted, I think, a very balanced uh, approach between uh, safety on the one hand and practicality uh, on the other. And, uh, you know, whilst there are always horror stories that one hears in every jurisdiction, because there are factors that are just not known to the uh, the, the vessel operator coming in. Uh, as far as the US is concerned, those horror stories have been 
um, fairly few and far between. So, you know, congratulations to uh, to, to Matt and the and the U.S. Coast Guard uh, in that respect. I do think, though, is uh, you know certainly we're preparing our teams for the, the the second wave, which does seem to be upon us in 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 the majority parts of uh, parts of the world. Uh, I, I think we are not going to see a return ever to um, the normal, as referred to Matt. So I think some of the the processes that are now in place will be refined. They'll be we will all learn how to deal with COVID-19 more and more. But COVID-19, I think we just have to accept is going to be with us forever. I mean, it's not something that just simply dies out and never uh, reappears. And that's whether there's a vaccine or not. There will be a significant threat to uh, some of us for um, the foreseeable future. So I think some of the remote access, some of the remote surveys, um, uh, communication techniques, technology, et cetera, will... Um, very much be with us. But I think, uh, you know, as far as our organization is concerned, dealing with the US, it's been, uh, uh, as I said, one of the more um, practical and measured jurisdictions to this crisis. Thank you, Mark. Thanks very much. Um, uh, we're now going to move on to our second presenter, uh, Philip Eastall, who is founder uh, of the Container Shipping Supporting Centers. He has worked in the container sector for many years and held a number of senior from fleet manager to deputy head of the global marketing. Philip founded CSSF, a voluntary working group, which aims to highlight and raise awareness of the current issues affecting seafarers globally and gain corporate support to both address these issues and implement changes which will improve seafarers' lives at sea. Over to you, Philip. Thank you very much indeed for that uh, kind introduction. Yes, uh, we, we sit in the container shipping um, sector. Uh, we're a, a voluntary working group. Uh, this is uh, something we do in our spare time. We, we all have our day jobs and uh, we all have a passion to uh, support seafarers and try and help improve their well-being, welfare and happiness on board, on board ships of, of all shipping uh, areas. Uh, whilst we sit within the container shipping sector, uh, well, as I say, we're supporting the seafaring community uh, globally in, in all areas of shipping. Um, first slide, please. Um, okay, basically, we, we explain there um, how we came about. I, I was uh, originally looking to help support one of the maritime charities, uh, Stella Maris, or Apostle Ship of the Sea, and uh, was a trustee for a few years, but uh, found a trustee was a little bit restrictive, um, very, very rewarding in the sense of being able to introduce and open doors, uh, but effectively uh, coming from a, a working position in an operations world, um, having to get things done yesterday, um, there's a there's a little bit of delay for me in, in, the, in the charity sector of being a trustee. So the only way we saw of addressing that was to set up a container shipping supporting seafarers and um, if we could go on to the next slide, please. Um, we formed a team of professionals within our shipping industry. Uh, we have some uh, very high profile people there. I'm a uh, guy's, guy's predecessor, um, Pat Peter Hinchliffe is on our board, previous Secretary General for the International Chamber of Shipping, but, but many others, uh, all, all in their respective positions. Um, we've spent many, many years in container shipping or, or associated industries and are able to pool our passion to help seafarers together and uh, focus on specific projects that actually deliver um, costed, timelined, and um, um, specific projects that, that, that will hopefully benefit seafarers' well-being and welfare at sea. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the questions I was asked before presenting this uh, uh, today was to look at how we do actively do that. Um, so in our in our working roles, uh, we all interact with various companies in the supply chain uh, that affect uh, either directly or indirectly seafarers on board ship. And in our world of container shipping, I'm highlighting here some of the main problems that we see on a, an un unfortunately too regular basis. Um, you're all probably familiar with the the publicized fires that have occurred on some of the um, major container ships uh, around the world. 
we have other problems uh, as well, which should anything go wrong on board ship will directly affect the life of the seafarer and his well-being. Um, we've had all kinds of problems that we've been looking to address in our industry. Most recently, the problem of overweight containers. Um, when they're lifted, if the cargo inside is too heavy, the, there's a risk that the floor will literally fall out. Um, cargo can shift. Uh, we have problems with uh, stow collapses on board containers, ships, which again, if a seafarer is in the vicinity, it could be fatal. We have problems of uh, misdeclared cargoes being put in containers. Um, some of the fires that break out on board container ships are most definitely caused by, by misdeclared cargoes. Uh, that also, of course, encompasses illegal cargoes. And um, leaking containers as well. We can have all kinds of uh, containers which carry liquids uh, leaking, potentially hazardous cargo, again, directly impacting on the, the well-being of the seafarer. So there are both commercial aspects here, of course, which are being handled by the respective bodies that look after that side of things, the P&I clubs, the shipping lines themselves, and of course, all the work being done directly with the shippers. But we focused on how can we look at addressing this from a seafarer perspective? And if I could go on to the next slide, please. Um, okay, this highlights the two main problems that we see on container ships. Uh, examples there of fires on board ship and also stow collapses. Um, very serious and, and I can't imagine what it must be like to be on a big container ship out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean when a, a fire breaks out, such as the one in the bottom left-hand picture of the slide. Um, uh, can't imagine it, and I don't want to, but it's uh, something we want to try and stop uh, 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 most. Next slide, please. So together with um, other official organizations in our shipping industry, um, we set about addressing this um, primarily to uh, educate shippers, uh, cargo packers, distribution centers, and those involved in the cargo booking processes how we can uh, help protect seafarers by taking better care of the containers before they get loaded on board the ship. Uh, this was called the Cargo Integrity Campaign. I sit within the, the top organization, the Container Owners Association. Uh, I sit in that organization uh, professionally. And other bodies that joined this uh, initiative included the World Shipping Council, the TT Club, ICHCA, and the Global Shippers Forum. And we set about putting together a um, document which helps to identify and educate better ways of uh, packing containers or, or any, any uh, packaging that will be used for the transit of cargo. If we could go on to the next slide, please. Um, basically, we, we, we produce what's called the uh, quick guide uh, this was sponsored by the United Nations and has been published and was distributed last month. So within the industry, we collectively have uh, brought together um, some major international bodies that have all collectively engaged, um, realized that this problem can only be uh, achieved by uh, overcoming, by, by addressing these issues collectively. And um, so far, the, the uh, response has been uh, pretty much positive from, from all areas of the supply chain, not least, of course, from the container shipping companies. The Container Owners Association actually consists of primarily container shipping lines and container owners and operators. So we've had a lot of support on this, but the key thing that we've realized is how little information was out there about the impact of these problems on the seafarers when problems uh, occur on board ship. Um, next slide, please. So we are now actively involved in more areas of seafarer training. Um, we've been engaging with uh, one company in particular who will be able to deliver training by streaming to vessels uh, to help uh, train seafarers directly um, in, in many areas, not just in uh, perhaps uh, areas of safety, which of course is critical, but in areas such as their own education, um, development themselves. Um, one particular project we are rolling out imminently is 
the training of seafarers on board container ships who repair reefer machines on the reefer containers. They get very little training, uh, generally speaking. Most training for reefer containers is taking place on land. So we set about engaging with the reefer machinery suppliers and introduced the concept of training seafarers to help identify problems uh, which Okay, they will also help save cargo, but also avoid accidents on board. Um, an old practice that still goes on, I'm sad to say, is the splicing of power cables. These cables carry 440 volts um, electricity, and consequently, when seafarers splice those cables to help repair or run two machines off one cable, you're creating a, a really uh, lethal hazard. So. Uh, we've gone about the process of, of helping to support seafarers' welfare from a more pragmatic approach, engaging within industry, um, getting buy-in from the corporate companies. Obviously, we've got support from the shipping lines themselves. And um, this, this way of going forward and improving training for seafarers, we believe will actually have a very, very beneficial effect on, on improving their welfare. Um, this year, of course, as has been highlighted already, we're living in a world of COVID. Um, we have found that some of the training that we've been delivering has actually helped focus their minds on other things than worrying about COVID. Crew change, of course, is, is on their minds as well. But these kind of projects that we're working on are being introduced in a world that still carries on in the supply chain of moving containers around the world on container ships. Where, where we have seafarers. Um, unfortunately, yes, on a container ship these days, they spend less time ashore. The turn time in uh, container ports is less. So interaction socially with, with other, other seafarers or indeed just being home is not happening. So we're trying to find more ways of introducing more ways of training that will help occupy them, but in a positive way and, and hopefully uh, benefit them in their futures. Um, one quick example would be we've got a training module with mentors available to help prepare CVs, and that falls under another project called Coming Ashore. So these are all ways that we're helping to uh, improve welfare and well-being of seafarers on, on board ship. Next slide, please. That, that really sums up my uh, presentation and uh, would be welcome to take any questions. Philip, can I um, firstly commend you and your, your organization for the work to, that, that you do? I, I think it must be um, increasingly difficult to approach the issues you have raised there and targeting from the organizational end because uh, COVID-19 is not just a, a background noise to our business. It's a, it's a deafening roar. And, and, you know, we are as organizations spending um, nearly all of our time in dealing with the practical fallout from, from COVID-19. I think your point about training is uh, perhaps the only uh, angle to uh, uh, approach this now and deliver the good work that you're, you're trying to do because, uh, you know, it is all about, as, as was ever the case, it is all about um, effective tra training of crew and the challenges that we now have uh, where you're just not able to get crew in large numbers to perform that training. As an, as an organization, we teamed up with um, Adobe and we have uh, a e-learning uh, product whereby we are not just able to uh, deliver training packages including some of the ones that you were talking about to uh, crew via app-based solutions and, and and internet but also i think what is more and more required is individual training so you get away from the um generic um commoditized training packages and you look at what individual crew members training we have the technology now you know one little positive out of this um, whole pandemic is that technology has, has advanced in leaps and bounds. We have the technology to view and monitor each of our crew members and what they individ their individual training requirements are. And that's, I think, the key. And I think if we're talking about crew welfare, we're not just talking about the welfare of crew as a, 
a, a, a generic whole. It's about individuals. It's about people and their their own particular individual training needs. And I think if we get that right, and I think most um, most companies either are or certainly have it on their uh, radars, then we we will solve a lot of the issues that you're you're tackling. I, I have to say though, I think as far as getting companies' attentions on new guidelines, new regulations, etc., yes, they're nice to have. But the, the the deafening roar of COVID is is drowning out a lot of this, and uh, um, you know the, the the angle for coming at this is definitely on the training side. Just just for for what it's worth, my my opinion. Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much, and and Philip, thank you for that excellent presentation. Uh, conscious of time, so I'm going to now introduce our third panelist, Deacon Paul Rosenblum, who is the president of North American Maritime Ministry Association (NAMA). Uh, Deacon Paul Rosenblum began his work in Seafarers Ministry as a volunteer with the Charleston Port and Seafarer Society in 2004 and currently serves on their board of directors. In June 2020, he was elected to serve as the NAMA president and board chair. Uh, Paul, over to you. Thank you very much. I um, assume you can hear me okay. Yes. Um, I'd like to speak uh, this morning from a seafarers welfare providers uh, perspective on some of the issues that the pandemic has caused for seafarers welfare and for our ability to serve them. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, from my standpoint, this pandemic has caused three crises for seafarers. There is the, of course, much talked about crew change crisis. We'll hear more about that later on, something very serious that needs to be addressed. But I also see a shore leave crisis and a ministry restriction crisis, both of which are having significant effects on uh, seafarers' welfare. Next slide, please. So I took some data from, you may familiar, be familiar with the Wilhelmsen map of COVID-19 port restrictions. And this I took through September 30th. And there are 114 countries on that map. And if you go through and look at how many are allowing crew changes, it's, you count at that time 71. Um, and that sounds okay, but it's really not quite as good as that might sound, certainly. But of those 114 countries, only 23 allow shore leave. And there, oftentimes there are significant restrictions on those as well, uh, shore leave for medical purposes only. And oftentimes uh, ambiguities in the regulations, inconsistencies in the regulations. Um, what exactly does shopping for essential goods mean uh, for a seafarer? That can be interpreted in very uh, many different ways. So that's less than a third of the countries uh, that allow crew changes are allowing shore leave. And the reality is though, even in those countries that are allowing shore leave, company policy or the captain's decision, uh, most ships are denying shore leave to their crew. They are restricted to their vessels. They are not receiving shore leave. Next slide, please. And so just uh, from our, our perspective, they, this means that they have reduced or little opportunity to go shopping for the necessities that they need. They cannot come to our seafarer centers, even though for, we, they may be in walking distance of the ship. Uh, they are not allowed to come there, which means they have reduced opportunity to communicate with family and friends uh, through the Wi-Fi that most seafarer centers freely give to the, to the seafarers. And most importantly, I think we all can relate to this, there is simply no or little opportunity to get off the ship, see something else and relax for an hour or two. And as I talk with seafarers, although they don't often admit it, and we know so seafarers can be a stoic lot, um, these are adding to the feelings of isolation that they feel even in the best of times. Next slide, please. And there's also a ministry restriction crisis. Um, at the start of the pandemic, nearly all seafarer centers around the world were closed either on government or port authority or perhaps church orders or voluntarily uh, closed themselves for their own safety. A lot of those have reopened, but many seafarer centers still remain closed around the world. Um, those that are open uh, have greatly reduced staffing 
most of our seafarer centers are staffed by volunteers. As, as we say here in South Carolina, because we don't want to call people old, volunteers of a certain age. But these older men and women voluntarily withdrew themselves from service for their own protection. And so we are operating now with greatly reduced staffing in most places. As far as ship visits go, if they're allowed at all, and many times they aren't, they are generally limited to the bottom or the top of the gangway. And it's very rare now, and I'll, I'll point out some data from my own experience, very rare now to get beyond the top of the gangway. Whereas in the past, we would go quite easily to the ship's office or the crew mess and the galley where we could meet with other ship, uh, with the seafarers. So I just put up here a little bit of the data from my own terminal, the North Charleston Container Terminal here in, in Charleston. And this is for a six month period of time. Uh, in that time, I have served 96 vessels that have called at the terminal. Five of those crews have come over to the Seafarers Center and have requested shopping. Normally in a normal year, that would have been 80 of those, crew, of those crews. Another four crews from, from four other vessels came to the Seafarers Center. They could not go ashore, but they were allowed to come to the Seafarers Center to use the Wi-Fi. And again, those numbers would be much higher under normal circumstances. And as I've gone to visit those ships, only 20 times have I gotten beyond the gangway. Whereas in most cases, that would have been a, just a given that I would get to the ship's office or to the, uh, the crew mess in most cases. Next slide, please. And this is having a lot of uh, effects on the seafarers as well. Um, fewer opportunities to interact and converse with seafarers on vessels, in the seafarer centers and in the vans on the way to shopping trips. Many of the seafarers are just wanting to talk to somebody that they don't know, somebody different from the 20 or so other seafarers that are on their ships. And they want the opportunity just to have a casual conversation, to talk about family and friends and what's it like in Charleston, what's it like in your home uh, city. And these are, are pretty much gone. It would not be unusual in the past to see anywhere from five to 20 of the seafarers on a given uh, vessel. Now I may see one, one or two or three only and have the opportunity to talk with them. We have a greatly reduced opportunities for providing religious services for them and you know, particularly our Filipino seafarers uh, are very anxious to have prayer services, communion services, masses on board their ships. And those are, that is gone uh, for all practical purposes now. And greatly reduced opportunities to talk to those seafarers who might have pastoral care needs, family issues at home, uh, other personal problems. We just don't get to see them any longer. And again, we all know as seafarers are they being this stoic lot, it's hard for them to admit it, but you can see by talking to them and hear in their voices, feelings of isolation uh, that they just wouldn't have, beyond what they would feel in an, under normal circumstances. Next slide. So as I talk to my colleagues around the country and in other countries, uh, we are trying to meet the challenges that the pandemic is, is posing to our ministries. We are now much more in the business of making shopping trips for seafarers, including acting as uh, shipping addresses for things they order from Amazon or other online sites. Uh, this can be quite time consuming. It can be quite stressful um, it, and particularly for understaffed uh, seafarer centers, this can be quite a burden on the few people who are working in any given center. We've increased the, uh, the bringing of gift bags of toiletries, snack foods, and religious items to vessels. This typically was something only done around Christmas time, uh, but now this has become a, uh, a year-round uh, 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 endeavor on many seafarer centers parts. Um, this is, well, there's a cost involved of this, of course. Uh, and since, as most of us are operating under with limited resources, 
this can be quite an economic burden on, on the Seafarers Center and the Seafarers Ministry. Fortunately, we're finding lots of very generous partners in, amongst churches and civic groups and in the industry as well to help us in this way. It is, it always amazes me when I bring a big bag of potato chips of, uh, and other snack items, how wonderful that simple gesture is to, uh, to the seafarers. To help offset the communication problems, there's been an increase in supplying portable Wi-Fi units to vessels. This too comes at a cost. Uh, typically in centers, we provide Wi-Fi uh, at, at a, at for free. These portable units have a cost, so which we either have to pass on to the seafarers or eat the cost ourselves. Again, with limited resources, that can be a burden to a center. And most importantly, we are enhancing the use of social media, uh, Facebook, WhatsApp, and other communication uh, platforms to, to keep in touch with the seafarers that we do meet in the centers. Uh, I receive messages on Facebook routinely just for somebody to say hi, because they just want somebody to talk to. But many of the seafarers welfare providers around the world are, in, are started their own chat with a chaplain app specifically to allow seafarers to communicate when they have some pastoral or other issue that they need to, to, com to communicate and talk with with a chaplain. I participate in one myself and this is a very, very rewarding for me, but I think also a very valuable service that we're now applying to seafarers. Next slide. So just to conclude then, um, we I don't want to minimize the crew change crisis. This is something that must be dealt with and we'll hear more about that shortly. But I think we also need to recognize and talk much more about the detrimental effects that reduced shore leave and restrictions on seafarers ministers are having on seafarers welfare. And we in the ministries and our industry partners and government agencies as well must help us in this way. We have to continue to be, use our imaginations to continue to continue to develop new ways to carry out our missions to ensure the welfare of seafarers. But we also have to find ways while at the same time protecting the seafarers and the, and the populations that they're moving into from exposure to the virus, we have to find ways to help them get ashore. I will tell you just to finish, uh, two days ago, I took a crew from a vessel uh, that had not been ashore since February. This was their first opportunity. I cannot tell you the joy that they have in simply going to Walmart. Uh, when going to Walmart becomes a special occasion this tells you something about the, the difficulties that they are having. So I think I will finish there and thank you for your time and welcome to answer any questions later. Paul, Paul thank can, you very much. Can, can I just very quickly um, uh, say something and, and uh, please don't take it in any way disrespectfully um, from the, the, the fantastic work that you and, and other missions and ministries do and, and no one is disputing the, the charitable nature of the work and the good hearts that you have. But I have to say, and, and we are very much in tune with what our crews are feeling and wanting, shore leave is just about the last thing on anybody's mind. Uh, uh, equally, I have to say uh, that, that most of our crews feel, uh, it's not a question of shore leave, it, their issues are uh, mental health support by professionals, uh, by professional psychologists for when the stress gets too much. Their issues are with identification and the fact that they feel or felt an invisible sector in uh, the global marketplace and the, the lack of communication. And on that point, I have to say that the various missions and ministries need to tech up you know, they, they, they need to get more savvy. And it may be, I don't think there's any lack of will there, but there may, there may be the lack of means because I've not seen one sermon delivered by app to my crew members' uh, 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 mobile devices. We, we, give, we send them mental health uh, tips continuously. We send them fitness tips. We send them uh, uh, training uh, 
sem seminars and, and lectures, but there hasn't been one approach that I'm aware of uh, in relation to uh, approaching our seafarers and having virtual sermons and virtual pastoral uh, care. Now, if that is a problem, and I suspect it might be simply not knowing, then, you know, I would, I would be here now offering you uh, our services to do just that, because we have seen in crises on board our vessels, the combination of professional psychologists linking with mission uh, chaplains and reverends and, and, and uh, uh, priests of various denominations is the utmost optimal tool. So, uh, and that can be done, that can be done effectively through technology that we have now available. But I do say, you know, to, to be talking about shore leave and, uh, uh, you know, the, the crew, crew missing that. Yes, of course, but there is a real world and our crew are intelligent people and they feel safe on board their vessels and, and walking around Walmart would scare 90% of my crew out of their wits uh, uh, than uh, staying on board a safe ship and being identified and communicated and, and having access to uh, a religion of whatever denomination. So my offer, you know, please, Paul, to you is, and we can communicate after this, I will give you the tech. Uh, if you want the tech to reach out to the vessels, you, you, we will give it to you. But that is a, a serious lacking at the moment. And, and I think, you know, mission, missions and ministries need to um, rediscover some of the uh, zeal to to get on board uh, vessels, harnessing the technologies now available, and and provide that service, which is out with unquestionably required. Mark, thank you very much, and, and Paul, thank you, uh, and that is uh, certainly a very kind offer. Uh, now I'm going to hand over to our final panelist, uh, Guy Platham, who's had a vast career spanning some 30 years in the maritime industry, and most of you probably know him uh, from a deck officer all the way through to master to now secretary general of the Prince. Trade Association, ship owners and operators. Uh, Guy, over to you. Thank you very much and uh, thank you for this opportunity. And I just want to uh, pay tribute actually to the welfare organisations like Solomaris and Mission to Seafarers because they have done an amazing job in, in difficult circumstances, particularly as a, lots of their fundraising has been curtailed because of the, the, the COVID pandemic as well. So it's a perfect storm of an increased need for their services. Uh, and also uh, sometimes struggling to get the funds to do that. But uh, that was a really interesting presentation. And uh, just thank you very much for that. I suppose that as an ex-seafarer, um, I can remember having been extended trips sometimes a week or two weeks beyond the time. And I can remember how down I felt um, of, 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 at that time. But uh, to have some crew members as we have now, who've now been on board 14, 15, 16 or 17 months, um, you can imagine how they must be feeling and, and all the support that it's been being in terms of mental health and pastoral care is, is really important. But if we could go on to the, the next slide, please. So just to give you a, a, an overview of the situation, in a normal month, when, you know, it seems normal, seems a long time ago now, 100,000 seafarers uh, change each month. So it's 100,000 seafarers off and 100,000 seafarers on. And it works quite slickly, and uh, that's what it's been for, for many years. But since really the world shut down for travel in the middle of March, we at best only about 40% of crew changes are actually taking place. Um, and this is uh, now for a situation where we've got some 400,000 seafarers now uh, on board ships beyond their, their contracts and spend, sometimes spending many, many more months. Uh, a friend of mine, he's a chief engineer, he did 200 days of a 60 day contract, which gives you some idea that the length of extra time they're going for. And as someone said, it's like getting to the end of a marathon and suddenly being told you've got to run yet another marathon again. So it's, it's such a, a vital and important issue. And I'll just give you some figures here uh, because it, it is always hard to get the exact numbers, but from the Philippines in April, 2019, in 44,854 seafarers left the Philippines to go and join ships. In April 2020, that number was 597. And in August 2019, there was 38,000 who left the Philippines to join ships. In August 20, it has improved since April, 13,359. So you see the scale of the problem that we've got. And it's not just that they're beyond the contract. The, the other thing which, we've, which we're concerned about is the denial of access to medical treatment. And we've had many, many stories of seafarers 
of, of not being able to get just the basic medical care they need. One example the other day was a captain who had severe toothache. And we've all had toothache. And it took a week before he was allowed to leave the ship um, to we were able to act as a dentist. And that's just a relatively minor ailment. We've had other heart attacks and all sorts of things. Uh, so that's, that's been a real issue as well. And as ship owners, um, we are all really concerned about the fatigue, safety and, 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 and the mental health. And also, actually, from the business side of it, from the integrity of the entire global supply chain, because we so rely on these workers. Next slide, please. So what, why are we where we are? I suppose why are we at this point? Firstly, governments started looking into themselves as soon as the pandemic grew. They looked after their national populations. That's completely understandable. But they focus on those public health issues. The global travel network virtually shut down in the middle of March. Um, commercial airline travel was, was down to a, a tiny percentage of what it once was. And governments imposed strict quarantine and lockdown controls across the population at large. But throughout this, the, the ships kept on moving, kept on giving supplies. And, and there was a complete lack of understanding as to the importance of shipping by health and other ministries as they focus on this particular problem. And I have to say, there's been a complete abrogation of international responsibilities by some governments because they've just focused on the national efforts. They have failed to live up to the international obligations under various conventions. And, you know, they, they, in that, that to me is, is also something for the future, which we really need to address. And also all sorts of other numerous bureaucratic other hurdles have, have been imposed in trying to get crew changes happening. Next slide, please. If we could move on to the next slide, please. Uh, thank you very much. We've had a lot of media attention on this problem. Uh, but it's not enough. You can see just a few snapshots of some of the, the, the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Financial Times. We've been on CAN, Bloomberg, Reuters have networked it around. We've been all around the world, but it's still not enough for things to, to change really significantly. Next slide, please. And we've got to remember that shipping transports about $7 trillion worth of goods each year. You know, and, and so the, the, throughout this, seafarers have kept on delivering the fuel, the food, the medical supplies throughout this pandemic. And I don't think people understand that that global supply chain is quite fragile and that resilience is now under threat. And we've already seen in recent weeks detention starting to take place. So if this continues, that resilience, that supply chain is in great, great danger of uh, just being disrupted further. And that is a threat to the national economy. So if they can't even get the fact of the humanitarian aspects of this crew change, governments need to understand there's a real threat to the recovery post COVID as well, the threat to national economies. And I think there's, as, as part of that, it's just a complete lack of appreciation of the actual risk that seafarers take. There was a blanket approach made, let's exclude them. They were treated as pariahs in some places, but actually seafarers generally are at a lower risk than the general population. You know, you by the nature of a ship is a, you're, you're, you're in quarantine often for weeks on end. Next slide, please. So what have we been asking for as an industry? What are our key asks? What is so important? We've heard that recently. We must designate seafarers as key workers providing an essential service because they are. We implement the, the industry as a whole, came together and in, uh, introduced protocols which allows the sea and, and hopefully reassures governments that we can manage the safe crew changes. And interestingly enough, this afternoon I was at a, uh, another IMO meeting where the protocols we've developed are going to go forward to the next Maritime Safety Committee and will be adopted as formal guidelines by the IMO with, with, with luck. We need the governments to accept internationally recognised documentation as evidence of a seafarer status. There's numerous bits of documentation a seafarer carries. And as a result, remove the necessity for national lockdown or travel or other quarantine restrictions, if we can follow the protocols, keep them safe so they can leave and join ships in a, in a, in a measured manner. And we need to provide seafarers with immediate access to medical facilities at all times, so for countries to absolutely to live up to their, their uh, requirements under the various uh, conventions which are out there. And we also need countries to start increasing access to commercial flights because that is also an issue and seafarers uh, ship owners have gone to extraordinary lengths 
um, to, to get true changes taking place. Next slide, please. So what have we been doing? Um, on the political side of it, we've been lobbying very hard. We've had ministerial summits. We've had a United Nations joint declaration. We've had the United Nations Secretary General come out and, and very strong in support for seafarers. We've even had the Pope um, coming out with a strong statement in support of seafarers. We took, we've had UN General Assembly high level events. We know there's a resolution being, uh, being considered now to be adopted by the whole United Nation. We've had bilateral conversations with governments. I've seen unprecedented level of cooperation between the IMO, International Labour Organization, the World Health Organization, the International Transport Workers Federation, um, ourselves, and all sorts of industry players, all lobbying very hard on that political level. We, we, we made great strides into the media, but it's still not enough. We're still not getting that cut through to those other ministries. The transport ministries get it, um, but it's the other ministries that really need to get it through government. On the practical level, We've put in place these protocols I've talked about. They run to 68 pages that shows the level of attention we put into this, covering every aspect of a seafarer's journey from leaving his home to joining the ship and vice versa. We've looked into testing, providing guidance around that. We've developed medical guides for ship owners and for the ship's crews to follow and how to treat COVID. We know that ship owners have been chartering aircraft just so they can get the seafarers on and off the ships. We know ship owners who've diverted ships thousands and thousands of miles at considerable cost to affect crew changes. We've also put in place, and, and it has been highlighted by previous speakers, as, as welfare support, mental health support for seafarers as well. And it's not all doom. The many countries are now much more open for crew changes. We learned last week that South Africa is now allowing crew changes, which is, which is great, um, but it needs the commercial flights to go in there. And, and we've, we've seen Singapore has relaxed its stringent requirements as well, which is to be welcomed and, and, and really starting to move ahead on that. But it's still not enough. And we really need uh, the crew changes to be taking place at scale if we can uh, stop that 400,000 rising to half a million seafarers, which actually is a million. If you consider there's 500 or 400,000 seafarers waiting to join ships, sometimes with little or no pay. Uh, next slides, please. So what are we going to do as an industry? We are working very hard with a couple of governments to try and get another summit in place with a much more tangible commitment. The UK hosted summit was, was, was good. It moved the dial forward, but now we need to take it to the next level and to really focus government's minds. We're looking at all sorts of campaigns in the run up to Christmas. Um, we're sort of, you know, are we going to sort of raise a prospect of Christmas being canceled? because the supply chain will break down and people can't get the supplies in. So we'll be working on various cam uh, campaigns there. We're working on the practical level, it's particularly within the labour supply countries, about getting into testing and quarantine regimes so we can make sure that when we seafarers leave their, uh, their the country of residence, they are COVID negative and there's some reassurance to governments that they can then join ships COVID ne negative. And so when we continue to lobby really hard at every single level, we, we work with airlines. I've got uh, correspondence here with Qatar and with EasyJet here in the UK and numerous KLM and other airlines as well to try and to get them on board the idea of, of, of repatriation and uh, seafarer flights. And the one thing I can promise everybody is that we will certainly never give up um, on this until we have a solution. And it will come, but I fear it may take some uh, many more months before we actually get to that position where this is normalised. So that's a very quick run through of everything that's going on in crew changes. It's such an important topic. And I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Guy, thank you very much. Um, now, I appreciate uh, for our audience members, we've, um, we have run slightly over time, but we are the last panel. Uh, and I'd be very keen to get Mark's thoughts on, uh, on Guy's presentation. Uh, before we'll, we'll quickly run into a poll before closing, if, if time allows. Mark, have you got time to spare? Yeah, I think, um, you know, thanks to Guy, thanks to the work of uh, ICS, thanks to the work of IMO, thanks to the work of uh, many of the shipping institutions. Uh, all they can do, of course, is shout and uh, shout about key worker status uh, and raise the, the profile of uh, crew and, and shipping generally. Of course, uh, as we all know, when countries are uh, obsessed with protecting their populations, 
uh, from contamination. You know, sometimes there are victims and, and uh, all too often we see it as, as being our crew. I do think, though, that the narrative needs to be changed. I think crew, uh, we need to treat our crew as intellig more intelligent beings. And uh, uh, from our experience, and, and as I said earlier, we we really have focused on identification with our crew and communication with our crew. If we communicate with them and explain the situation, if we identify with their needs and their support needs and their communication needs, and we provide those, uh, if we provide training and if we modify our uh, approaches on board to give them the, the safe environment and the relaxed environment that, uh, uh, that they need, then they'll pretty much put up with anything. Our morale on board the vessels is the highest it's ever been. Let's not forget that. Uh, I think all too often we forget the stresses of those involved in the shipping sector ashore in trying to uh, look after our crew on board. And there are huge stresses associated with rotations and last minute changes to rotations, which impact massively on the mental health of uh, uh, of our people in crewing departments in the various offices and in, in, in various other shipping companies. So let's not forget the those colleagues ashore as well as the people uh, on board. I think shipping has done an amazing job. I mean, there is uh, uh, no sector which has, I believe, come out uh, with more accolade or, or deserved accolade than shipping. The propellers have kept turning throughout this despite, you know, vast challenges. And if ever we... Uh, showed ourselves to be a resilient, flexible, um, uh, adaptive industry, then it's through COVID-19. I think we'll continue to do that in this second wave that is uh, uh, falling upon us and, and will bring, uh, bring new challenges. But I, but I, do, uh, I, I do thank uh, ICS Guy and, and, and the work you do, uh, as well as IMO, uh, to, to shout our cause and, 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 and get it heard. Very important, though, not to forget, when you weed out the numbers, uh, actually, I think the numbers of crew stuck on board vessels is far below the numbers you say. Our numbers are below 100 of crew over 12 months, and that's from a pool of 15,000. Not good enough. Uh, we're working uh, night and day to uh, get that better. But there are always reasons for that. There is no point taking crew off a safe vessel uh, where they're in contact with their families and uh, feel secure and sending them into uh, a, a very dangerous environment, which might be their ultimate home or indeed a, a stop off point. And you hear horror stories of crew being stuck in interim uh, airports and ports, not being able to make it home or getting home and not being able to make it out to their villages uh, in the countryside. So, you know, there are lots and lots of factors. And I think sometimes the argument on crew rotation is simplified. But that's uh, that's just my opinion. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Um, OK, now can we go to uh, our live poll? Uh, I understand we're going to get some facts and figures on the screen. So question, uh, what do you consider to be the most important element of safety in shipping? 76% um, of the audience said um, our seafarers. Uh, which aspect of uh, mariner welfare do you feel is the most important? Um, mental and emotional, um, can't quite see the rest. Um, uh, positive health, um, mental well-being uh, looks to be the answers there. Um, uh, no surprises, I don't think. Um, uh, Mark, any any analysis on 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 that data? It seemed to come up very quickly and then disappear. Yeah, I, I don't think there's any surprises there, is it? I mean, you know, we we've all had time uh, over the last six months to focus on what really matters in our lives and a personal and professional. And I think most of us realize that it is people. And you know, technology was the talk of town beforehand. It is the, uh, the, the, 
the, the tail of the dog and not the tail that wags the dog. Our people are the most important elements and we have to look after our people and we have to look after the welfare of our people, both on board and ashore. We've got a great company or we've engaged a great company, mental health support solutions, trained psychologists. And I can tell you now, when I go on board vessels and I do, uh, I get thanked not for the multitude of I hope good things we do for our crew, but for the mental health support, the hotline, the helpline we give them uh, to reach out in times of, uh, of, of stress and pressure. And, you know, coming back to uh, hopefully my not, my not disrespectful comments to Paul, uh, I would love to extend this hotline, helpline to uh, a ministerial and, and, and missionary one and you know that I, I before I disappear I, I, I extend that offer again please take it up uh, we can get sermons on board all of our vessels uh, through the technology that is now available please please take it up uh, thank you uh, now just to close uh, thank you the audience for uh, listening I hope you found it informative uh, and insightful uh, importantly thank you very much to our panelists uh, Matt uh, Guy, Philip and uh, Paul and Mark, uh, thank you once again for, uh, for listening and, uh, and your participation. Uh, that concludes the uh, time. This was an extraordinary opportunity for us to see a full range from regulatory compliance to the advances of digitalization. And while Shipping Insight 2020 focuses on fleet optimization and innovation, as our last panel clearly demonstrated, nothing is possible without the welfare of our mariners. And we're very grateful to those mariners for the work that they do propelling our ships so that we can provide more than 90% of the world's goods and energy to global society. Thank you for joining us for the second day of our deep dive for Shipping Insight 2020, a vision for the decade. We hope you rejoin us on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday when we have our conference and exhibition. You'll see a range of topics plus networking sessions in the afternoons. And on Monday night, we have celebrity karaoke. And on Tuesday night, it's celebrity stand-up comedy. You don't want to miss a bit of Shipping Insight 2020. So we'll see you then.